Hello again. Welcome back to the Michelangelo stage. Our next presentation is called Putting Data to Use. Um, we have a heavy overload of digital data out there. So um, these are the two thirds of the studio men from Berlin. And they will explain you what, what to do with all this data, what awesome things we can actually start doing with them, what we can use it for, how to visualize data, and what is it good for. So please welcome Stefan Thiel and Stefan Fiedler from Studio Nand from Berlin. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Cheers. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Jana said, we are uh, Stefan and Stefan. Um, and uh, we would like to talk a bit today about data and data visualization uh, because we work a lot with data and technology in our studio, which is called Studio NAN. Mm -hmm. And um, but not we not don't not only work exclusively with data and visualization. So um, so actually there are three of us, and Jonas is not here as you can see, but he's not far away. He's not far away, yeah. And. Um, when people ask us about our focus, uh, we have the problem a little bit that we don't really have this one single expertise. So we are always in a bit of trouble. Yeah, so we see ourselves rather as multidisciplinary designers having multiple focuses in a way. Um, so we always come up with these short excerpts to explain a bit what we do. And uh, this is rather strange a bit, but stay with us while we explain it. Um, so we, we often work, you know, or coming from the Olympics, going to the SIGGRAPH in a fantastical caravan with mutant products in the back and a good data set of Shakespeare on the dashboard. So we have a blurry laser focus. Yeah. We are working at the intersection of multiple um, disciplines um, and try to, to combine different disciplines to create new ways of dealing with topics around society and technology. But um, it's not that we only work on the intersection of those disciplines, but we also try to focus on what else is there. Not only work, uh, looking at the immediate and, and obvious solutions or, or, or ideas, but also trying to explore the other fields uh, um, and the, the not so obvious directions a little more. So we do practical research and we apply this research in uh, practical design projects, real world design projects. That's where the data comes in. So in those days, we all aggregate data a lot through our devices we carry around, through like different services. Okay. So I'll I'll use this microphone and hope you can hear me better. Again. <laughs> so um, through all these services we use, through all these devices we have, through all the different kinds of new sensors we can use to explore our environment, the amount of data we get is exploding and um, the tools we can use to explore this data are exploding as well. The performance is now nearly for free with Amazon EC2 service, uh, the Raspberry Pi, everything is getting really cheap, really fast and storage is like nearly the same. So. Yeah. But you know, all this technical availability is not enough, of course. So because the world is really a serious place, so whenever we talk about technology and data and, and all this technology-driven stuff, we need to keep in mind that we have a world which has many, many complex problems. And we need to use this technology and, and apply it to these problems. And hopefully, we can come up with a design solution which will help, help us to, to implement you know, uh, solutions for, for real world problems. So this uh, code is a bit, you know, you have to take it a bit with a smiley, um, but we do, or we are convinced actually that data and data visualization and technology can help improve the world we live in. And we would like to show you a couple of examples from our own work, but also from other uh, companies and, and design studios that we really um, like, and um, to, to give a bit of an idea of how this uh, technology can help you know, um, create change, for instance. This is a project changed by us, uh, created by uh, local projects. And this is a community initiative, uh, a website, basically. It brings people together and allows them to, um, to, to write down problems they have in their immediate neighborhood uh, and they would like to have solved. And people can see these um, problems being um, written up by various neighbors. 
and then support these problems and so people can get organized and this actually leads to real change in the in the urban environment of New York City by planting trees um, you know organizing um, you know community meetings better and stuff like that and we are really inspired that this mechanism is uh, really powerful and it allows a sort of like grassroots improvement from the bottom up basically so on the one hand side this tool creates is a a kind of communication channel, a place where people from a local area can meet and discuss things. And through this discussion, through these counting ups and all these things, this tool also creates a kind of awareness. So it rates different topics with different levels and people can get an idea, uh, can better get an idea what um, their neighbors think about this area. Yeah, and basically what we're talking about is technology and data. So you can use this platform that you that, that is custom designed to achieve those uh, things that we've just described, and you can use this platform to bring people together, help them communicate better, mm -hmm. and at the same time you're generating lots of data and you get a better understanding of all these complex things that are going on in the communities, and uh, this helps us understand those processes better and to optimize them really, and while. You know, we, we, we actually came to that problem or to that mechanism and change by us because we are working at the moment to, um, in a project where we think about um, um, helping some problems uh, concerning the, the, the Baltic Sea. And mm. there's really lots of stuff going on. This what? image is actually from the Gulf of Mexico, but yeah. there are actually to that point, the uh, seas in the world are so overnutritioned that there exist lots of dead zones, which is basically, you can see it here, that that zone is on the right. And this is a problem because agriculture is putting masses um, um, of nutrition into the sea. Plankton eat this nutrition, <laughs> um, producing ox oxygen on the way. Then they die and sink to the ground, and on the ground there's um, bacteria waiting for this plankton and also eating them, basically. And in this process, they use up all the um, oxygen in the sea, which is basically really a dead zone in the sea. Fish, there's no life in this area, in the right area. So it's a really serious problem. And um, this also exists in the Baltic Sea, and the problem here would be, what is the cause for this, what, are, what is the cause for this dead zone? And uh, how can we implement some things, some, some infrastructure, some, some networks? How can we bring people together and, and, and help improve this situation? So how can uh, systems and infrastructures like change by us, for example, be applied to those topics, to those problems? And it's all about design with technology, because you design the platform, you design a web-based platform of whatever, uh, however that might look like, but you design a system which involves technology and data yeah. to do actually real-world changes, mm. and this is what we're really interested in. Yeah, to make the world a better place with lots of confetti and little robots. Yay! <laughs> Great. Yeah, um, but it's not always about you know creating systems that acquire data uh, or produce data. It's also about data that is already available out there in the world. And um, luckily, or um, yeah, fortunately, there is a, a large initiative um, already getting massive, you know, momentum, uh, which is an open data mu movement, which means uh, city governments or city authorities, local authorities, but also nations. Uh, governments uh, open up their data sets because the data belongs to the people, they produce it um, and you can readily access it and already you know without implementing a large set uh, of technological systems you can just get data um, which is of interest to you and use it to create uh, designs yeah. and, and, and products and stuff like that. And a classic example is the CIA fact book so the CIA is like collecting all kinds of information about all countries um, globally and offering it online in a kind of database which is like just text files and you can just use them and for example just map them out and there have been many interesting realization projects based on that already and um, this is on this global scale but uh, New York was one of the first cities to do it on a, on a local scale, so they had tons of data about New York itself and they didn't know what to do with it, so they just published it and said to the people, you just like do whatever you want and just and, yeah, get inspired and play with it and 
uh, now they have like the third um, competition a big competition with fifty thousand dollar prize money and people are just like experimenting with it and playing with it and um, yeah companies like local projects for example from New York are working with it as, as well yeah and also uh, Berlin is ca uh, catching up on this as well yeah. So there is an open data portal, uh, yeah. or data is openly distributed in a kind of okay way. Yeah. You can improve it a lot, um, but there is a, uh, already a website uh, for open data in Berlin, and we would like to see much, much more of these, or many, many more of these initiatives, and more structured data, mm. more, you know, e easier access to the data. The tools to deal with the data is another thing, uh, but we will come to that later. And as Stefan said, there are many more. We just listed one of um, the most two important, I guess, United Nations and OECD. Um, they have this big global scale as well. Um, includes loads of nature things and really interesting. And uh, UK, Australia, US, you name it, all the big countries. Everyone is there. So uh, data is out there. You just have to get it and um, do good you know, design projects and, and, and really think about apl um, applying this data, putting mm -hmm. this data to use. One good example of, uh, is from a close colleague and friend, uh, Moritz Stefaner, who we are working with uh, at the moment as well. And um, he, together with Rau Reif, uh, also a cr uh, creative consultancy in Berlin, they have been designing, and uh, it's, it's, it's online, you can, you, can, you, can, you can access it already now, um, the, uh, a visualization for the OECD Better Life Index. So what the OECD does is to, to, to ask people in different countries uh, and mm. kind of judge about their like, life uh, mm. quality and what they kind of favor in, in their life, uh, what they prioritize. Um, is it a you know, green, green living environment or is it good jobs or, or um, access to education and stuff like that. And you can, you know, uh, they have designed a, a really nice website which uses these kind of flowers to, to visualize all these um, results for the individual countries. And each leaf of one of such a flower um, uh, is representing uh, one, one of these uh, data aspects. So for instance, um, yeah, housing, income, jobs, community, education. This is all what people have graded and, and rated their country for on this OECD scale and uh, kind of visualized in this uh, portal or website. So this is a really nice way where you can compare uh, countries and have a, a glimpse in, in an instant uh, what people think about their environment. Yeah. If you're thinking about moving to Norway maybe, then you can see what people say about Norway. Mm -hmm. And also what is um, interesting, it's, it's not just about this numerical kind of data. This is the kind of obvious form of data that we always think about. It's like uh, numbers, calculations, statistics and stuff like that. Um, but we would also like to encourage you to think more creatively about data and what to represent in data or with data or how data can basically look like. And uh, one example we really like um, is an initiative which uploads all um, laws, all federal laws of Germany to, um, to GitHub, which is a code sharing, programming, collaborative website. And so what is actually happening is it's not only that the text is readily accessible and people can check in new versions of the laws, uh, which is actually a nice analogy to, to how we work with software, but it's actually this mechanism that we, that we treat a more traditional medium such as text, uh, such as laws, with these technological paradigms or with these technological methods. So the way we people, the tools people have actually invented to create software, to write software and to program, um, are in this case applied to the evolution of a, of a, of a law, of a, a law text, basically. <laughs> and um, so this allows you to, to go there and see the changes that have been made in the text, in the law, with each step when, when something has been edited. And this is actually really powerful because people can, for, for the first time, you know, uh, get an idea of how the laws are evolving over time. And this is, at least for us, this hasn't been possible uh, so far. And we need more visualizations, we need more um, um, and more practical um, projects that deal with this data set and, and, and increase the awareness around what is happening there at the moment. Because only technolo technology aware people can 
uh, understand it at the moment. We need to communicate this to a broader audience. This is a great idea for a project, so we're giving it away for free right now. Just do it. Get some visualization tools and uh, create the evolution of uh, laws in Germany. Uh, visualize it. And why we find this interesting is because we have done this in kind of similarly um, in, uh, with a project we are currently doing with researchers from Swansea University who are um, translation studies researchers. And um, what we're kind of doing is to, to think about ways of analyzing literary texts, texts um, such as uh, Othello by William Shakespeare. And especially in this case, the focus was to um, visualize the translations, multiple German translations of the same text and how that um, varies on, or how they vary um, uh, in, the, uh, in the text, basically. So the researchers are really interested in which passages of Othello have in, uh, invoked more varying translations in German, into German. There's um, over 50 um, German translations of Othello. And um, so it's, it, the project was actually about creating digital tools, a web-based infrastructure with which people can upload German translations of Othello and um, annotate them, visualize them, uh, and actually work um, on on understanding the complexity that is uh, a multi-version document. So in this screen here you see basically text underlined with a certain color which highlights how um, strongly the translations vary. And this is also part of the research project to, to um, uh, calculate this variation. And then you can actually compare different translations of this of Othello. And, and see how the translate, translators have chosen to, to translate different um, parts of the text uh, differently. And there's also more high-level uh, visualizations which deal with how, which part of a space text has been um, translated or, or uh, yeah, translated in which part of a target text. For instance, this is a version by uh, Hans Zimmer, and it's a, um, uh, this is the, the, the Othello speech to the Senate. It's a long, long monologue, and this has basically been split up in multiple uh, smaller uh, segments across the text. And this is stuff that is becoming visible for the first time by applying these, yeah, technological methods to a rather strange subject, which is a, a literary text. But the combination actually opens up new possibilities in how we understand cultural heritage, translations. Uh, and also the history of translations and of different texts. So data is material and we have to get familiar with it and, and, and actually learn how we can use it in, in other contexts. And uh, more get going more into history, like this is a project we have been doing, a research project, which was initially about visualization of the dramatic structure of Shakespeare plays. So this was the first step that we actually decided, okay, what if um, a literary text, if we treat a literary text as data, which is a kind of, to literary study uh, scientists, it's a really uh, strong <laughs> statement. Uh, we get lots of discussions um, because they don't see the value for now, or not everyone does. Um, but uh, we are convinced that it's at least worth exploring the possibilities technology can, can have in understanding dramatic texts better. And this is also part of our design process. We work lots, uh, a lot with programming and, uh, and different um, uh, database technologies and stuff like that. And we always sh shape the visualization from the data by directly working with it using a programming language. And um, so it's not that we start in the, uh, in the top left and, and work our way down to the bottom right but we immediately see the results that we're, or are the results of our work um, uh, applied to the, to the whole text or to the whole data set. And then we try to optimize a certain visual representation to what we, are actually, want to, uh, what we actually want to express about the data set. So in this case, it's uh, three different uh, evolutions of, of different visual approaches to visualizing uh, Shakespeare plays. It's all available at understanding-shakespeare.com. So feel free to have a look there, and also on our website, uh, nant.io. 
And uh, this is also part of the process that we have been applying in a more recent project around the Olympics. So we were commissioned by the Arts Council in, from the UK um, to work out how the global attention on London 2012 this summer worked out and we worked together with Future Everything uh, from Manchester and uh, Moritz Stefana who did the OECD project as well and worked about one year about one year uh, on visualizing the global attention mm -hmm. and what is what we usually do is we we, we, we I mean, there is a focus in this in this project. There was a focus on real-time data from social networks, so Twitter, Facebook, this activity and stuff like that. So, and what we usually do or have to do is first of all to get an understanding of the data. This is the same process that you have been seeing in the videos before. Um, so, what we needed to do here in order to understand sports events that we try to visualize actually. Um, is we need to get our hands in the data and, and see if there's interesting patterns uh, we can use um, as a sort of like direct on a sort of like direct way to the design process for for the visualization and so we have been working together in the beginning of this project with DataSift, the data provider from the UK um, who has access to the Twitter firehose which is all Twitter messages potentially 400 million a day um, and uh, so we have been doing initial studies and, and working especially in the early sketches with sentiment analysis. So basically an algorithm that tries to say like this message is positive to this and this degree or negative to this and this degree. And um, we found this interesting. Uh, first of all, because it's a rather fuzzy measurement, you know, emotions and, and sentiment is a fuzzy measurement. Um, but the algorithm supply or suggests that it's actually really empirical and, and numeric and, and exact. So we have been plotting or, or observing different sports events before the Olympics, in this case the Golf Masters in the US, and we have been plotting or collecting data for, this, uh, for the Golf Masters and just simply plotting it in this, uh, what we now call centigraph, but it's just, a line, it's, just a, um, uh, it's just a plot where you have the sentiment scale on this axis and this is the time axis. So you see um, more um, high volume, uh, high volumes of Twitter messages, and uh, if they are positive or negative. And this is interesting because um, if we compare it here for Tiger Woods, or if we see this graphics uh, for Tiger Woods, so all messages mentioning Tiger Woods, it's not really interesting, or we don't see anything really interesting there. There is something hidden there, but you don't see it now. Um, there is another interesting effect. Uh, we can see if we see um, Baba Watson or messages for Baba Watson and there you see a huge huge spike in positive messages at the end of the um, golf masters and this is because he surprisingly won this um, uh, championship mm. and Tiger Woods was highly or, or strongly dis, uh, discussed in the beginning but then you know sort of like um, failed or didn't really achieve what he wanted and thus the discussion abruptly ends nearly at the same point in time when Bubba Watson wins. So this surprise moment was hidden in the data and we needed some to sort of like figure it out by looking at it in this way. And then we came like, oh, okay, what can we do with this information? This is really interesting. There it starts, uh, events start to shape, um, to, to s start to be, uh, or start to reveal it themselves. And this is how we get up with uh, Emoto. Or so Emoto is um, the final piece online right now in archive mode so it was live during the Olympics and uh, as Stefan said we were like tracking the golf masters in spring and also the European Soccer Cup just to get an idea of these sports events to get a glimpse but the biggest problem was always that we never would have the scale so like everyone said from from data for example the data provider at that point that uh, Twitter is going to get down so so the, the fail whale will go up and e even Twitter won't be able to handle it and then we're, we're always a little bit yeah, like afraid how we could handle this huge amount of data in real time but did it in the end quite proud of it and uh, these uh, couple of uh, are these the first days yeah yeah these are the first days uh, kind of centigraph as well 
the gray line you, you see is uh, the amount of Twitter messages and uh, the pink line is the average sentiment. And uh, we mapped out two, two tweets at that point, um, which are rather negative at that stage. And um, we were quite happy that our system worked, but um, as you can see on the next slide, that it was, um, of course, really f focused on um, big cities. So this, this fact uh, that we wanted to achieve the, the global emotion was still, in the end, really based on big townships as well as in, in the US. So while this is exciting to work with uh, such a large amount of data, we have to keep in mind that we're focusing on a limited part of the world or a certain part of the world which has the technology and access to the technology to actually produce that kind of data. And so we are always excluding a significant, a significant part of the world. And we were thinking about this in the beginning, but there is actually, as I mentioned before, set up, setting up an infrastructure which allows people to, to contribute data to the Olympics is not an easy task. So we um, um, found it more um, interesting then to really see, okay, what can we do with what is there? At, and you see here, for instance, also plots that helped us develop the design, uh, the design of a moto mm -hmm. is to see like um, mapped uh, tweets, for instance, to, to mm -hmm. see the differences, uh, how the opening ceremony was uh, perceived in the US uh, and in the UK. And the sort of like first world problem around the data um, mm -hmm. is kind of immediately visible in this map where you see like how strong um, the UK and the US are represented in this data set. So with this information in parallel, we start to play around with different visual concepts, design ideas that we try to explore. And one initial idea was about using figures to uh, display tweets and uh, with figures which represent the dif different uh, disciplines. Yeah. So we, we try to morph disciplines together in, the, in, in terms of, of actions. And I also did like a couple of sketches. Oh, should be on click. Should play on mouse click. Ah, yeah. yeah, it's moving. It's moving. It's moving yeah. yeah. They are moving. <laughs> Watch closely. <laughs> yeah, there, there. So this is actually motion tracking data, which is available on the internet, and uh, we've played around a bit with this because it was also a big topic for many design projects on the internet uh, with the Olympics coming up, you know. Um, but still, I mean, it's uh, it's really an interesting for us. It was really interesting to see, like, can we actually get that dynamic of sports, this movement, people fighting against or challenging each other, and stuff like that, and so. We, were, we have been some initial, doing some initial sketches uh, that just try to combine uh, incoming Twitter messages or in incoming social media messages and attaching to the bodies and, and stuff like that. But we decided since we wanted to focus on the online, uh, on, in, uh, on an online visualization, this is not really feasible in the browser. And also we have to ask, will people get that? Will people actually get some useful information out of this representation? And so we have worked uh, lots of lots of more, so we're making a huge jump here. And this is the uh, final design for Emoto, which we are quite happy with. And um, this is more really, really reduced. This takes a lot of time to reduce you know, visual representations to a really clear and concise form. And so we have been coming up with this um, uh, origami shapes, which actually um, is uh, all the positive tweets on the top and all the negative tweets on the bottom. And each triangle represents one step of sentiment. So this is, as, as, as you can see here, quite positive. This is very positive. And the same for the negative ones. And the triangles are um, sized or scaled according to the number of messages we have been uh, tracking for one specific topic uh, and one specific sentiment category. So if this one topic is um, discussed very, very positively, you will see it with a huge or um, a larger yellow um, triangle. Yeah. So compared to the the uh, athletes athlete icons before, we really just focused on this new aspect of visualizing the sentiments and represented them with those triangles. 
And so this is the, the website design, emoto2012.org it is at the moment. Um, we're getting rather low tweets, so there can be downtimes at the moment. And this is a bit of a walkthrough through the interface. So the origami shapes are kind of a central element and at the start page you can see how many tweets we are currently receiving for the Olympics. And then we are splitting all these tweets that we are receiving for the Olympics up into different topics. And um, we use these topics then to really track what is going on. And it's not just about athletes and disciplines, but also about the traffic situation in London or empty seats in the stadia and stuff like that. Yeah. And James Bond about the Queen, everything, so especially the the opening ceremony we were entering the, these keywords live while, while watching uh, when, when the Queen was jumping out of the helicopter and uh, was supposed to jump. All right, I'm just trying to skip a little bit here. So this is uh, the topic view. You see these different topics. They are updated in real time and, and, and scaled according to how many tweets they uh, we receive for a given topic. And then there is something which we call a live stream or a stream view, which is all messages flying flying by in a constant stream and you can sit there, read them and, and, and kind of like stop each tweet, retweet, retweet one and stuff like that. So yeah, this is the main part. So here you see a, a, uh, another overview of a basketball and you can also use these uh, origami shapes to illustrate how a topic evolved over time. So of course for the final, which is here, <laughs> the last mm. day. Um, there's many, many tweets, many, many positive tweets, Dream Team wins. Yeah. Uh, and, and also if there's an incident or something happening here, you s the messages tend to be r rather positive in, on average. So uh, if there is a negative, a stronger ne negative uh, uh, ten tendency, then uh, th this is immediately a hint for it. Oh, that was something interesting. And then we're also combining this with, together with Moritz, who's doing all this stuff on the fly, uh, producing such centigraphs, such, such graphs, to really do some kind of like data-driven journalism. So getting his hands into the data and, and coming up with graphics which uh, you know, display and represent the, the evolution of a topic. And this will, the project will, uh, is still ongoing and will end in September in the UK with an exhibition where we get take all this data 14 14 14 uh, 14 point five million tweets and produce it in a, in a sculpture and, and display information on top of it and stuff like that but uh, feel free to come back to our website later to see how that went out so now we want to open up a bit um, so we do lots of programming to, to design stuff as well and illustrate and all these programs but on the other hand we also tinker a lot so we electronics we we go to craftsmen we go to the metal workshop wood workshop you name it and um, we are interested in topics that are on these boundaries of data one of them is randomness was our main topic for the last last year one and a half years and randomness is fascinating because it's this kind of chaos and people hate chaos, people like structure and discipline and want to be safe. But in our society right now, we need perfect chaos to have this structure. Every kind of science is using random numbers. Every, everyone who's selling you an insurance, for example, or everyone who's a politician is using models that are tested, which are based on random numbers, just to make us feel safe. And uh, these random numbers are really expensive. So when the Postbank, for example, is buying random numbers to generate your PIN, um, they are paying quite a lot because there are companies who are tracking uh, particle movement on a really, really low scale because we can't um, figure out how they move. This is kind of random for us. And this is a seed to produce these numbers. And there have been books in the past, like in, in the 60s, which are just stuffed with random numbers, which scientists use. Um, so we set out and built an object that's uh, visualizing atomic radiation, radioactive ra radiation. And um, you can see up here, so this is a kind of a cloud chamber and in the middle there's a little needle with um, lead, radioactive lead and all this alpha rays are popping out which is rather beautiful. Yeah, you can see it here. And we use this as a seed for random numbers. Um, just to have, like, to, to, to make visible uh, what, what, what these companies, for example, use to sell us our 
our post-punk pins or HSBC and uh, we built several devices one of them is also a kind of Geiger counter where you can go out and explore the area and you can collect uh, random numbers in place where you might need them at some point so this is kind of speculative approach on this topic of randomness or you can just out in the sea and hold it up in the wind and these little flags will flap and produce random numbers. So this is a kind of another approach where we try to break out out of the usual daily business and explore other areas which then feed back into our work. And all these projects uh, include heavy exchange with uh, scientists, of course. Yeah. Uh, so we're working also on a, on a Syn SynBio project, uh, project at the moment, and also this exchange and this communication, learning about different topics other than design, uh, is what really like you know makes us move forward in a way. And so. What we like to illustrate a bit is how technology, data, and, uh, and, and also things you wouldn't expect, such as random numbers, have a huge impact onto our lives and how we can you know, rethink our relationship to this. Yeah. And create an awareness. And creating awareness was also a project back in 2009 where Jonas and I did our B BA um, back in, in Potsdam, not far away from Berlin. You should go there, it's really nice. And um, we're exploring how a digital identity could look like, which was rather really popping up at that point because you could create profiles everywhere. And um, here we compared uh, our two identities at that stage. So we, we were like collecting all kinds of data we could get from Amazon, uh, from Last.fm, from Twitter and Delicious about ourselves and created like um, a character based on four different aspects. One was interest, so we, we looked at the tags we used on Delicious and paired them up, how we used them. We looked at the age of our profiles, so how old we actually were. Um, the update frequency, so were we like heavy users or not. So there's a rather big difference between Jonas and me. Jonas is the top one and I'm the bottom one, so I'm really like rather steady and Jonas is a bit spiky and uh, the communication behavior so are we having dialogues or monologues on, on, on Twitter um, and use these factors to create um, three dimensional sculptures come on it should play does it not yeah, so we generated these 3D sculptures and also printed them in plaster. Maybe we just have a look at the final image. No, 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 no. No? Yeah, so we had finally like six different identities which were sculpted in space based on those four different parameters that we extracted from all those tons of data. Which was also a really interesting point because we had like a huge database and had to figure out how, what's really important in there. So we had to like filter, aggregate, and make up our own rules how to evaluate and verify what's in there. So the goal was to design a physical representation of a of a digital identity that, of digital traces that we leave behind in the on the internet. And this directly leads off to the, to the workshop we are doing this afternoon. So, back in 2009 we printed them already, so we had like big sculptures. And we prepared a little sketch um, where you can enter your campus party number in the bottom left. And can adjust a couple of things as you like. And you will generate your own digital identity, which is going to be printed here tonight and you can collect it tomorrow. So if you're interested in uh, using data, using digital tools, creating objects for printing and actually printing them, Campus Party has done a great job on getting yeah. a printer for the workshop, so thanks Applause. for that. Yay! <laughs> so please feel free to drop by at the workshop at 2.30 uh, this afternoon and uh, join us for some oh, oh shit. fun. <laughs> thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Cheers. I think we have time for questions. If you're 
Hi, thanks for the very interesting talk. I was wondering two things. Uh, one is the language thing with the Olympics. Um, I was wondering whether the bias is also due to language, that you only looked at in English, or where, I mean, or how you can build systems that are actually working on multiple languages. That's one. And the second thing is, I kind of was hoping that you would talk a bit about tools, um, and you didn't. So I was just wondering whether you could just mention a couple of tools where to start if you are interested in just basic stuff. Mm. Thanks. So about the first question, um, we, we only had English in the end, so, um, which was a bit sad because we couldn't use the data provider because of like, policy issues, which was a problem. But you can do it now in six languages, I guess. Yep. So they offer it in six languages. And, uh, but I mean, still not enough, definitely not. But there are really interesting projects which use like um, big law texts, uh, for example, from the European Union or from like the UN or so, which are tra translated in like many, many languages, like hundreds of them. And they use this as a source to like build systems, computational systems that can translate, like cross-translate everything and everything in a way which is like we are really coming up right now. Yeah. And, uh, so, and also the main practical reason for supporting only one language was um, we use Lexalytics. This is a company which provides the sentiment analysis and, and, and has provided it uh, free of charge to the project, which we are really thankful for. Uh, and they use it or they provide it in six languages, but implementing the sentiment analysis process for six pipes in parallel, basically, involves lots of uh, technological overhead, which we couldn't handle because we were a team of uh, four people and stuff. So we decided to focus only on English. I, for instance, am native German speaker, uh, but tweet in English and stuff like that. So w we, we found it more interesting, or, or the focus was really to illustrate what is possible. And uh, we, could, we are so happy and, 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 and hoping to, to get another chance to make it a bit more bigger and to address the really global scale of, the, of, the, of this project. And regarding tools, that's one of the biggest issues at the moment. We are working with mainly with programming, so we have learned, spent lots of time learning how to program. Um, and use tools mainly processing, but also for data analysis stuff, uh, it's Python, which we really like. Um, the Emoto infrastructure was built in Node.js uh, and Redis and stuff like that. So it's all different database and programming languages, uh, database technologies and programming languages. And there isn't yet a ready-made tool which helps you to explore larger data sets easily. And this is one of the main problems. And you know, I would love to see projects like this, you know, coming up and, and people building software that, that built those tools. We try to make our tools available as open source softwares on GitHub. Uh, we have to do that a bit more now that the project is over. Um, but yeah, we, there's definitely not a really easy tool for people without programming knowledge to help explore uh, these uh, big data sets. Any other question? No? Um, my question was, um, how do you come up with the scale? Because you said you have quite positive um, sentiments and also not so positive ones. You just said that it's an uh, external firm which provides you the data, but how do they analyze it? How do they know this was a very positive comment or tweet and this was a very negative one, a medium negative one? So the traditional approach is really, and this is also what is available with open source software a lot, the traditional approach involves large corpora of, of t sentiment tagged texts. So there's, for instance, a large corpus um, on, on online discussions and forums, and people have sat down and tagged each word with a certain sentiment score, where, 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 wherever it is possible and makes sense. Um, so these approaches just look up those words in these corpora and say, like, okay, everything taken together is an average sentiment of plus three or whatever. Um, Lexalytics does lots of more really smart stuff under the hood, which you can't see. It's a black box, so this is their basically their uh, product, um, and they do it really well. So it was among all the sentiment analysis engines or, or, or softwares we have tested, uh, this was the best 
uh, th this provided the best results, which made a lot of sense. And they basically give you a, a float value or a, a floating point value uh, back for like how positive or negative it is. And we have basically compressed this down into the plus minus six um, levels that made sense for us to not make it too complex, the representation, uh, but also to have a little detail in the, in the sentiment. Uh, hi guys. Um, looking at the literature thing, things you do, so um, you're trying to, uh, especially the one you're showing us today. Um, so you've compared different translations of Shakespeare, and there's on my question is: Are you you have have you discussed with lots of literature scientists because of the fact there's there's always a reason for why the translation turns out to be like that or to be a different translation. So you're mostly sharing these things with scientists, are you? Yeah, I mean, the, the project is actually headed by Tom Cheeseman, Dr. Tom Cheeseman, who's a reader in German at Swansea University. So he actually approached us for the project because he saw the understanding Shakespeare stuff. And his interest as a translation scientist or, or as, uh, as a, as a scientist in uh, dealing with translation studies um, is in actually this variation, historical, social variation in translation, but also how uh, different purposes for which translations were made are basically represented in, in the translation itself. And if we can measure that, and if it would make sense to measure that at all, we don't know that. Um, but it's definitely interesting and provides interesting results so far. And this project where we have uh, shown the screenshots, this is a first small funded initial stage, uh, which we now put out to discussion for uh, a broader range of or broader group of scientists to discuss this with us, what makes sense, what doesn't. And digital humanities is a big, big scene at the moment, so they're rather excited about it. Um, but still, you know, it's uh, we, we we need to find like you know uh, to evolve this further, definitely. So scientists have basically came up with it. Basically, came up with the idea. <laughs> this project really nicely underlines uh, the dialogue between uh, the or what you as a designer should always have with your client or the one you you talk to, and not just really like get an idea and walk off and come back at some point. And being in the middle of um, literary scholars, computer scientists, uh, statisticians, and stuff like that, that's a, a really interesting challenge to, to bring those people together and, and get, you know, talk at, about the same thing. That's really it. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, it's really interesting. And you mentioned a lot of projects. You mentioned a lot of um, ideas that you have. You mentioned that you're tinkers. Um, what is the next step for you guys? What project? Uh, what projects are you focus? Are you looking at? Um, how do you determine that focus when you seem to have such a wide curiosity and and a limited time? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, as we said, I mean, uh, this sort of like tends to what we are interested in at one specific moment. This also relates to our lives, what topics we are interested in, for instance. For, I, I have a, a history of like theater practice um, from earlier years. <laughs> Uh, this is why I was interested in, in Shakespeare, for instance. And uh, then I, you know, had what I what I learned in Potsdam together with Stefan and Jonas um, and had all these ideas in mind in a completely different world and then like what happens if you put both together? So we will continue to work like that, I guess. Um, and also are always like, you know, welcoming projects uh, or, 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 or really also client-based projects where people have a specific goal and we design specific solutions for, for requirements uh, or just goals people have in the world. Um, other than that, we try to always reserve a bit of free time to, to research just around for instance, for, at the moment it's DNA and decoding of DNA and how, what can we do, how does that relate to our identity or what happens if your entire DNA is uploaded to, to, to the internet, for instance. And there's like, technology gets really cheaper in this area, so you can actually afford to, to, to get a DNA decoder and, and, and use that data. And so I think there's way too much inspiration there to tackle it all, but um, yeah. We will continue to be inspired by what our interests are. <laughs>
crazy times. <laughs> cool. I, okay, one more question. I was going to say crazy times is a good final word. Ah. <laughs> this is uh, just a practical question. The workshop this afternoon, why it is so long? I mean, what are the your purpose 